Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Bryony Smith. I'm a Principal Hydrologist and Flood Risk Consultant at Capita. Uh, and this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about a project we've been working on where we've been developing flood forecasting models uh, in Flood Modeler. So first I must seek forgiveness. Uh, I'm not a modeler. Um, I spent most of my career as a hydrologist or doing operational flood forecasting. So basically I selectively look at numbers and give it to a modeler and hope they can deal with it. Um, so I've actually rarely been let loose with hydraulic modelling until recently when they gave me a dongle. Um, so thankfully I've had some support, um, but I've got some sort of personal learning along the way. So this afternoon I'm going to briefly introduce you to different types of forecasting models, um, take you through some background to the project, talk a little bit about the methodology that we've used and also some things that I've picked up along the way. Um, so I wasn't sure how many people knew um, much about flood forecasting, so I thought I'd go back to sort of almost basics. So certainly within England, uh, flood forecasting models are, models are vital within the Environment Agency because they underpin the flood warning service. So the duty forecasters liaise with area staff to provide timely and accurate flood warnings to the public so the public can help protect themselves and their property. This means that flood forecasting models need to be able to run quickly so they need to be run and rerun regularly with updated observed data and also with the forecast data from the Met Office. Flood forecast models in England are currently 1D only, um, but with improvements in GPU and computing, it is possible that 2D models may become common in the future. Um, the forecasting models are simplified where possible. This is to reduce the run times, but they still need to be able to replicate the key hydraulic processes within the river. So the three main types of forecasting model, we've got the rainfall runoff, the routing, and the hydrodynamics. So I'll take you briefly through these now. Um, so rainfall runoff, I've been very basic about this, but basically um, converts rainfall to flow. So the commonly used model is a probability distributed model, or PDM, and it requires rainfall and evaporation data and has a number of parameters that you can calibrate to convert the rainfall to a representative amount of flow for your catchment. There aren't any specific hydraulics involved, so it tends to be used in sort of headwaters and natural catchments, um, and tends to be a lumped estimate to an outlet. And it also helps if you've got a gauging station at that outlet. Routing models are a very simplistic model that route flow from A to B without representing regular river sections. So you have wave speed and attenuation parameters that are used to try and transform the flow hydrograph from point A to point B. So basically, what you're trying to do is transform that hydrograph. You've got inflow at point A, and what you're trying to do is make the model create this hydrograph at point B. Having good quality flow data again at the up and downstream locations are vital for good calibration. And in your calibration, you'll tend to have observed data going in at point A, um, but during a forecast mode, you'll probably have a PDM or rainfall runoff model going in that location. So hydrodynamic models is what a lot of people will be working with. Um, so they're the most complex of forecasting models. They convey flow through complex river reaches, particularly where there are flow influencing structures. They're very similar to those developed for flood mapping or optioneering, and they require significantly more detail than routing models. The models can be simplified in reaches where the forecasts aren't required, as long as the flow regime is still replicated. So you can have a hydrodynamic model which has defined re reaches of routing sections, if that's suitable, but there might be some time-stepping implications on these models, as you, need, you can use adaptive time-stepping in the hydrodynamic, but routing models tend to need a fixed time-step. So a bit of the project background. Um, many of you may know that the Environment Agency are in the process of developing a new National Incident Management Forecasting System, which was previously known as the Future Flood Forecasting System. So this is replacing the, replacing the eight regional individual forecasting systems around the country. Um, and this system is being developed once again in Delta Fuse software by Deltares. So as part of this new forecasting system, they are consolidating the flood modelling software that's being used. So all the rainfall runoff models are being converted into PDM and all routing and hydrodynamic models are being converted into flood modeler. All the new models also need to be calibrated and then performance tested against a number of events. 
So the part of the project that we were procured to do was um, converting the models within the former Anglian region uh, and two bespoke forecasting tools from the southwest. So in the former Anglian region, most of the for for forecasting models were in the MIC-11 software. The rainfall runoff models were also in the MIC-11 format known as NAM. There were also some kinematic wave routing models that also required conversion. So for about 700 kilometres of watercourse, we have a pr developed approximately 40 PDMs, 11 complex, complex hydrodynamic models, and about six routing models. Um, so within these models, there are about 60 forecasting sites where the models needed to be calibrated. And just to clarify that if you need a forecasting site within a flood modeler model, you basically take it from one of the nodes, a bit like extracting results. So I'll go on to the methodology briefly. So we'll start with routing models, and you can see how simple this is. So we started by developing a model with the variable parameter Muskingum Cunge cross sections unit. Uh, and I've just put what that unit is, the symbol, um, in case no one's come across it. So this <coughs> unit is quite useful, as it can be based on survey data or previous model sections. And basically, you, from those sections, the software will create wave speed and attenuation parameters um, from the cross-section data, and then the generated curves can be taken from the ZZU file once it's been run in a boundary mode. So you will end up with a text file in the ZZU, which gives you your flow, wave speed, attenuation, and stage. Um, however, because of the cross-section data, the curves that are extracted from the ZZU file often tend to be quite messy. So this top one is a wave speed on the y-axis with flow on the x-axis. And in the guidance, this is what your wave speed curve against flow is supposed to look like. Um, so this means that um, we need to analyse them, smooth them, and edit them. And we found this to be most easily done in a spreadsheet. And your guidance also suggests that the maximum wave speed occurs approximately two-thirds of bank fall. Therefore, we've had to edit the wave speed curves to reflect this and to make sure the wave speed was realistic. Some of the sections that we took out were giving wave speeds of six or seven metres per second, um, whereas more realistically, they'd probably be maximum of one to two metres per second. We then created new VPMC routing units, which are different to the XX units, as they don't contain any cross-section information. They just contain the parameter curves, um, but basically these provide a smoother, it's supposed to provide a smoother relationship. Um, with a routing model, you tend to start simply, so you have a section at the top and a section at the bottom. Um, so that's how we started, and then we also located some extra sections where there might have been a significant change in the parameter curves. Um, but basically. Uh, we started with two sections, altered the wave speed and parameter, attenuation parameters, um, and then did that iteratively until we provided, until we'd reduced a reasonable calibration. The gauging station where we required the forecast, we used a QH control. So basically, we forced the stage discharge relationship. Um, however, you need to make sure that your stage, stage discharge relationship is reliable because this is very dependent on having a good rating. So the benefits of using flood modeler to develop routing models included the ability to use the XX to give a starting point with the parameters. It also helped to indicate where there are changes in the wave speed and attenuation based on the channel cross section. Also having the visual aspect of the model I found it much easier, so the dot dot and the GPX showing the cross section locations give me as the developer and the end user better appreciation of how the model is set up because previously the kinematic wave routing model was basically a text file with some information in it which wasn't easily understandable. The challenges I've encountered, uh, having accurate flow data at the top and the bottom of a routing model does significantly improve the prospect of calibration, which also corresponds with having confidence in the stage discharge rating at the gauges. None of the ratings within the project that we looked at were gauged above bank four. So this means we didn't actually have any conf much confidence in any of the high flow ratings within the project. The additional challenge is the influence of intervening lateral flow. So this tends to be ungauged and can bring a large source of error into the model. And finally, I think many of you will understand this from any type of modelling, 
you can spend days iterating the parameter curves to get it slight improvements in calibration and the challenge is knowing when to stop. So uh, if we've come up with some ideas whilst we were developing these routing models as what we might want to see in Flood Modeler in the future. Firstly is the option to get the model to auto calibrate the wave speed and attenuation parameters using observed data. And I'm not providing solutions of how you might do this. A simpler way to convert between the Muskingum XX section and the routing section so that you don't need to create a new section or a new node and do a lot of copying and pasting. Thirdly, an ability to set maximums or minimums for wave speed and attenuation so that they can be quickly scaled within the unit. And finally, um, this relates back to some of the new bits we were talking about earlier, the consider the inclusion of a PDM module within Flood Modeler so that model, mod, models can be easily linked and potentially calibrated in line or in parallel. So, onto the hydrodynamic models, obviously a lot more complex than the routing models. The hydrodynamic models um, predominantly converted from the existing MIC-11 models. The other option was to use the existing flood mapping models, but as many of these were um, modelled in 1D, 2D, it required a lot of extending of sections. So we stuck with the MIC-11 models. However, there's no easy way to convert a MIC-11 model into Flood Modeler. And the best way we found was to export the cross-section information from MIC-11, import it into HEPCRAS, export it from HEPCRAS, and then import it into Flood Modeler. What this process also does is strip out all georeferencing information other than the centre point of the cross-section. And it doesn't convert any structures which all needed to be included separately. So... Therefore, the development and calibration of the model was cyclical, sort of adding in the structures individually and then revisiting calibration. Now, ideally, the cross-sections would have looked like this on the left-hand side. However, if any of you have been to East Anglia, you'll, you'll know that it's quite flat. So there were a lot of embankments and a lot of low-lying floodplain. <coughs> Within the Mike 11 model, the extended sections had a levee function, meaning that the floodplain shown on the right image they weren't activated until the banks were overtopped. However, in Flood Modeler, the flood plane was activating before the channel was reached bank full. This meant that the right amount of flow was being conveyed through the reach, but the levels were being underestimated at the gauges. So in many places, the extended sections were replaced using reservoir flood plane units and spills to make sure that the flow was retained within the channel before spilling over bank. So one of the benefits of using Flood Modeler for the hydrodynamic models is that it's commonly used, for, commonly used software um, within the community and within the environment agency. So models can be revisited quite quickly if necessary. Secondly, the reservoir generator is my friend and it's probably been invaluable in replacing the extended sections um, and being able to add the stage volume relationship straight into the model using LiDAR data has been much quicker than any manual calculation. So some of the challenges that I've come across, other than getting the models from Mike 11 into Flood Modeler, one of them is converting the hydrodynamic models, is all the structure data and the operational rules. And this isn't a reflection on Flood Modeler, this is a reflection on data. So topographic survey often doesn't match what's in the Mike 11 models, and sometimes the structures in the mapping models are also different. So we have three types of structure, or three, stu three types of stru from structure information. <coughs> So also we have the information regarding the structure control that was limited, so structures could be manually operated during calibration events, but we didn't know about it. So this meant that actually getting, achieving a good calibration was quite difficult. Finally, Flood Modeler works in the flood forecasting system through a fuse adapter, um, which was a major challenge I encountered once I completed calibration, was actually getting the models through this adapter. Um, I discovered thanks to a chat with a help desk, that the adapter only works with ISIS version 3.7, whereas we developed the models in um, Flood Modeler 4.4. So I was having errors when we were testing the model because the adapter doesn't accommodate circular orifices or cross-sections with more than 400 data points. So, wouldn't it be lovely if all model software was interactive and we could convert between all different models in an easy way? Um, possibly not commercially viable, but on a more practical note, a better help section on the fuse adapter detailing what version of the model it works with. Um, I think a new adapter is being developed at the moment, 
Um, and it'd be good if that accommodates all the latest flood modeler features and gets updated alongside the flood modeler versions, because this means in the future, the flood forecast and model updates can benefit from the improvements in the modeling software. And my final suggestion for that would be a levee function, please, um, to prevent the early flood plain wetting and keep all the flow in one unit. So the final part of the modelling was looking at the model performance of the forecasting site. And this is what's known as performance testing. So this involves running over 100 peak events and looking at the statistics for the peak performance, threshold performance, and whether the model is creating false alarms. So for example, if the model crosses a warning threshold but the observed data doesn't. This testing is done for seven or eight lead times and with two rainfall scenarios, which is perfect rainfall, which uses observed rainfall data, and forecast rainfall, which is what the forecasters use during an event from the Met Office. This image just shows an example of um, an output from the performance testing. So basically, if you've got a score of one and green, then you've got a very good model performance. If you're red and five, then you're very poor. So you'll see that the performance is worsening the further out you go with the lead times. But also, running it with the perfect rainfall and with the forecast rainfall can identify where the, where the errors might be. So if you've got really good model performance with perfect rainfall, but poor performance with forecast rainfall, then you know that the error with the model is likely to be with the rainfall input data. Um, Plan B UK have developed a software called Math, which we use to calibrate the PDMs. We also, they've also developed some bespoke software that auto-generates the IEDs or the PDM inflows. So because we had to run so many um, variants for the performance testing, there was up to 1900, 1,900 runs per forecasting site. So that required at least 1,900 IEDs. So this would have been a lot to generate manually. Um, so Math created a way of developing these IEDs um, automatically. We, they're also used to process the flood model results into performance testing data, undertaking the calculations to work out the performance so basically, what we were aiming for is to get all our crosses in the bullseye for this one. So the benefits from the performance testing is that the software developed by Plan, G Plan B was a great benefit with its ability to mass produce IED info files, which saved a significant amount of time. Another benefit is being able to run the parallel simulations, meaning that performance testing model runs could be run quickly. There was, also, there was the possibility of using Flood Cloud, however, as the models only take a couple of minutes to run, we didn't think it would be efficient to upload it, so we used our own modelling machines. Some of the challenges I've encountered, um, the batch runner failed after 100 model runs or a couple of hours, so we got around that by just using the .bat file, um, but it just, it, Flood Modeler said no after a couple of hours. Um, and the other challenge is dealing with the sheer number of model and results files which require good housekeeping. So a um, couple of ideas for that is whether or not a bulk IED generator could be developed, um, which would be particularly useful for calibration and flood modeler. So if you had something that could pull data from multiple observed data files with specified event dates and just be able to create IEDs from that. Uh, additionally, just looking into some issues with batch runner, um, which means it runs beyond a couple of hours or 100 simulations. So in conclusion, we've developed 17 forecasting models within Flood Modeler for over 60 forecasting sites. We've used bespoke third-party software to undertake mass processing and performance testing. And we've used a number of the Flood Modeler features, some more successful than the others, although some of that success may be dependent on the ability of the actual user. We've also identified some ideas for additional features, which I've talked about. Now, as I said at the beginning, uh, I'm not an experienced modeler, and last week I cycled up this hill, and it felt a little bit like what I've been through with this project. Um, lots of twists and turns, and very much uphill all the way. But I've got some final reflections. Data is the biggest issue within a project like this. There have been issues with the consistency, availability, and the volume of data received. Despite thorough data reviews at the project outset, we've still encountered a lot of problems along the way which haven't actually come to light until we've used the data in anger. Secondly, 
Set yourself a target for the number of iterations for your calibration is a good idea because it keeps you focused and keeps you sane. And related to that, it seems that everything takes longer than you think, uh, even when it's not me doing it, and it's when it's actually one of your experienced <coughs> modelers that are working on it. And the final one, which I think several people in this room might relate to, and you do work it out eventually, is that despite your best efforts, you will never achieve perfection. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you.